Come on, one, two, three, pivot! How much fun was last week? Did you guys have a good time? Um, man, uh, I get emotional watching baptisms uh, at the end. Maybe you don't know that, but Pastor Daniel uh, getting to baptize his son Cooper, who just recently made a decision to follow Jesus. How cool is that? And then I look around seeing some of these kids. Yeah, I see some of these kiddos who, uh, who asked their small group leader in kids' ministry to baptize them. And so how cool is that? And so today that leads right into our conversation uh, about the relationships that you and I have uh, in our life. And so just a little bit about that video you just watched. Uh, we were in um, near the square at McDonough at the fountain there. And uh, two different things happened. One is uh, when Daniel falls into the, um, the, the actual waterfall or the whatever it is, the fountain there, uh, this lady literally almost just rubbernecked it and just almost went off the road. <laughs> And just froze, just stopped right in the middle of the road. Uh, and then a few minutes later, a cop who actually attends the church here pulled up and said, let me see your permit. And we're like, hey. And he was like, I didn't know it was you guys. And so we did have a permit, just so you know. Uh, and uh, the water was cold. Let's just say it that way. Um, but uh, we, how many of y'all loved the show Friends? Come on. Okay. Um, how many of you have no idea about the show Friends? Come on. Okay, so I got to catch you up to speed for those of you. So those of you who are like, what? Where have you been all your life? Uh, uh, some of you, some of you, but let me catch you up to speed on this idea of the show Friends. Um, look, it was funny as all get out. We know that. <laughs> but the reality behind the show was it was pretty dysfunctional. That's some pretty dysfunctional relationships. There were six friends <laughs> uh, who met, uh, basically spent all their time in a cafe coffee house in New York City, uh, shared apartments and across the hall from each other, and then marriages and divorces and remarriages and divorces, and then marriage to someone else and then remarriages, and then how you doing? You know, you don't let people date. You know, how many of you know you never would have let somebody, your daughter, date Joey? Come on. <laughs> but you love Joey, but not for your daughter, right? Uh, and then you had Monica, who was a real heavy girl when she was growing up and lost all this weight, who's now bossy and sassy, and she controls the former addict who's, you know, who's addicted to, to, to cigarettes and smoking and all the different things, Chandler, and then they get married, and it's weird. I mean, like, there's a lot of dysfunction. And, it, and, and look, I love the show. I'm not, I, I, I could binge watch it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> what we don't see in the show is the pain that comes from a lot of their dysfunction, though. I mean, Ross, come on, somebody, that dude. Um, how many times can you get married and be divorced in the same week? <laughs> you know, it, and it's funny. I mean, how many times? Do y'all remember the one with the spray tan? Come on. Yeah, so if you don't know, just go to YouTube. And bottom line is, these are people who spent years together. And then we come to the, the final episode. And they have to turn in their keys to the apartment. And, and, and basically, they're all just kind of reminiscing over the, the course of the last however many years it's been, <laughs> and none of them have really made any progress in life. And, and as much as it's fun to watch a show and engage in a show, like, that's, that's not real life. Uh, most of us, if we came to that point in our life and did what they did, we'd feel like a, a lot of failure in our, in our past and in our hurts and our hangups and from all our relationships and our dysfunction. And so today, I want to talk to you about relationships. And I'm actually going to share a message that I shared part of earlier this year. But I don't think, it's one of the things that God continues to bring to my mind and my heart as a pastor and lay on my heart is that um, I think in the season of, uh, of when we were quarantining and people were alone and uh, checking out, um, I think you probably realized a different way the need for relationships in your life and the types of relationships that you actually needed. Uh, there was a lot of things that happened this year uh, with um, disconnect and isolation. And the reason we started Relevant Church meeting again on Sunday mornings um, and only about 50% of our people are attending is we said that there's a mental health crisis that will far exceed the physical pandemic that we're in. And you can agree to disagree with me on that. I'm not going to argue with that. I just have to say to you that at the end of the day, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you don't understand some of the things that we have seen behind the scenes uh, the headaches, the pains, the suicides, the thoughts, the anxiety. We're actually going to deal with anxiety next week. But we need to be together. We need each other. We need relationship in our life. And isolation only causes a lot of other issues. But there's this passage in Proverbs that will be the springboard. And what I want to talk about today, in Proverbs chapter number 27, verse 19, it says this, A mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the kinds of friends he chooses. 
by the kinds of friends he chooses. So here's, here's the way I would summarize that. Uh, in, in maybe a, a more comprehensive way for all of us to understand today. And what we can talk about is that is this. You are where you are because of your relationships. Let that sink in. The relationships you have, I'll say it a different way. We'll throw this on the screen. The relationships you have are a combination of what you've created and what you've allowed, though. So let's, he says, a, a, a mirror reflects a man's face, but a heart you can sell a man's heart by the types of friends he chooses. And, and then we say, okay, you are where you are because of the relationships you have in your life. You can look in your life and say, this person's helped me in this season. This person's helped me in that season. And then you can also say, well, this person pulled me down. This person hurt me. This person harmed me. And here's the reality is sometimes you didn't choose all those relationships. Sometimes those were your parents or, or somebody in your life that was a brother or sister and they caused harm. It's caused you to go down a path that is not healthy for your life because it was a relationship that maybe you didn't choose. How do you deal with that? But then there's others of us who have chosen relationships, good, bad, and they've led us down these paths or dysfunction or maybe helped us in our walk with Jesus or helped us live a quality life or a healthy life. And so whether you and I realize it or not, we are the sum total of all the key relationships in our life up until right now. And that's hard because you think about your three-year-old childhood or your seven-year-old childhood or 12 or 15. And then you think about your college years and all the bad relationships. I won't make you raise your hands. And then you think about your relationship now and the dysfunction maybe that you've carried into your marriage or later relationships in your life that are affected by previous relationships in your life. So we, we now have a marriage that has problems because of other relationships or, or hurt or pain or chosen or not chosen, whatever it may be from our past is still carrying over because it's affected us. Here's what I want you to do. If you're taking notes or you can take out your phones, because uh, uh, most of y'all don't take notes, y'all just take pictures of the screen. And, uh, but I want you to do something. I'm, I'm, I want you to all do this. Just grab a pen or grab your phone really quickly. Uh, if you're at home, do the same thing. I've had you do this one time this year. I'm going to have you do it again. And I want you, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds of weird, awkward silence. And I'm going to ask you to name and write down. You can just put one word, whatever. One word or one phrase that, that tells of five sermons that I've preached that you can remember. Ready? Go. Last week, pivot, don't count, okay? Go. I can see all y'all are writing because y'all remember everything I've ever said. Literally, keep going. I'll give you a few more seconds. And if you're at home, you're maybe Googling online or whatever. Uh, like, like titles or, or, or main takeaways. Something that you remember about. I, I don't remember five sermons I preached, y'all. It's hard. You start going, there was that one time where he, he said something. What, would he, what did he say? What, what, what was that title? It's hard, isn't it? Now do this, same thing, same exercise. I want you to write down the names of five people or friends or family that have drastically impacted you. Go. That's a lot easier. You're like, okay, I got my five. I got seven. I got 12. I don't have to give you 30 seconds for that one, do I? Now this can be drastically impacted you for good or bad, right? Like you can be like my dad as I was a child, my, my previous husband or boyfriend or, or, or girlfriend or whatever, what I'm saying to you is that I can preach till I'm blue in the face. I can stand up here and preach messages that are filled with good content or bad, whatever you choose to believe. And you walk away and go, that felt good. But until you dig into the deep, dark sides, good or bad, and get into deep, authentic, challenging relationships in your life that can push you forward, that thing doesn't really take root in your heart. What you remember is that your 14-year-old best friend or your 22-year-old, you know, friend or when you got married or you see the relation. It's easy to remember the relationships that have impacted you. It's much harder to remember the things that have been said. And so community is and always has been central to the growth of the believer. In our lives as followers of Jesus, it is vital that we are in authentic biblical community. And, and the problem is, is we've dumbed down what that looks like in American culture. What I love about what we see in baptism today is that when we see some of these kids getting baptized or we see a mom or a dad or a single person, tears begin to flow down some of your faces because of the relationship you have. And they're not your family. 
They're just people you know that you built deep relationship with. When a kid goes, I want to get baptized, but I'm a little scared. A nine-year-old, a 10-year-old says, I want to get baptized. And we, we have them articulate what it means to follow Jesus. And when they can articulate what it means to follow Jesus, then we let them understand what it means to be baptized. And if they can articulate that, we're willing to take that step with them. But it's crazy to me. They go, I'm a little fearful to do that. And they say, but if you'll baptize me as my small group leader, I, I'm ready to take that step. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's not about the stage script over there or the worship and the environments. That's all fun. It's about the relationship. And so then, I want you to consider relationships throughout Scripture. And then I want you to apply this to your own life. Jesus comes in. Oh, there's all the Old Testament relationships, but we'll pick up in the New Testament when Jesus comes. Jesus comes into the world, and he's, he has early relationships in his life. John the Baptist, you see early in life, was an encourager. He paved the way for Jesus and People begin to look at Jesus and say, I'm not sure if this, this man is the son of God or not. And so he lives his life, and as he reaches adulthood, somewhere around the age of 30 years old, Jesus comes and calls 12 followers, 12 disciples to follow him. Not to just follow him and, and be at his beck and call, but to learn and to grow and be into authentic community. Twelve of those disciples had three, three of them were, I'm sorry, three of the 12 were very, very close to Jesus. They were in very deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. They knew each other. And then the other, the other nine were very close to him, but maybe not as close as those three. What I'm saying is, is even Jesus had close friends. Even Jesus had people to pray with him, even though they let him down sometimes. And those men, he didn't call them in one-on-one -on -one relationship. He called them, and it's the very first small group we see in Scripture and as far as the, the New Testament church is concerned. So we see these groups of men, these 12 men that are following Jesus. But there was one who never really let Jesus get close. He was faking it till he made it. He made it. His name was Judas. He was stealing from Jesus' ministry. He was robbing Jesus the entire time. The Bible says he, he oversaw the money that would uh, allow Jesus to carry the gospel and go around. So Jesus didn't touch the money. And Judas was stealing out of the money bag. And then ultimately all along his relationship with Jesus wasn't authentic. It was self-centered. I just wonder how many people we have in our lives that really all they want from us is, all they, all they care about is what they can get from us. And so we're going to talk about these relationships today. And so those 12 men, 11 of those 12 men would carry the gospel to the world, change the world, not because of some message they heard, but because they had been in relationship with each other and with Jesus. Saul in, in Acts has an encounter with Jesus. Saul persecuted Christians. He killed Christians. He, he murdered them. He stoned them. He was the chief among murderers because he didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God and he wanted to kill anybody who did follow Jesus. And so he actually went and asked for letters uh, that would certify him as a murderer. And then he has an encounter with Jesus that flips the script and we now know him as Paul and Jesus has been resurrected and he appears to, to, to Paul. We don't know how or how all this happened and we don't fully understand it because um, this is right after Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, and then everybody's trying to figure out, like, what's going on? And Paul has an encounter with Jesus that changes his life, and then he would go on to plant churches all over the world in Ephesus, in Philippi, in Colossia, in Rome. He would plant churches and start churches, and he would send messages and write letters to those churches. In every single one of those letters, you'll see a common theme, and the importance of the theme is that you are connected with one another. This is more than just you being isolated to follow Jesus. Acts chapter 2, the New Testament church launches. This is after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. 3,000 people come to know Jesus and are baptized in one day. And now they say they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread and prayer. They, they met together daily and in devotion to one another. They gave to those who had need. They cared for one another. We see that pattern all throughout the New Testament church. And so what we've tried to model as a church and if I can be honest with you, we collectively have failed at this. We had a great first 10 years. But I want to say something that might, and, and, and we, if we have to go backwards before we go forwards, I am 100% as your pastor okay with this. Because I never again want to see a pandemic strike our country where we now go into isolation and people feel lonely because they don't have the right relationships in their life. And the reason that some people thrived in this season, and many of the reasons, not the only reason, but some people faltered and failed and struggled is because they didn't have the right relationships around them. 
and you look, and it's easy to say, how, how did they do that? They don't even, it ain't even affecting them. I'm sure it is affecting most people, but when you have people around you to walk with you and stand beside you, and it's the right people in your life, you can see how people can make it in seasons where others don't. And so, we've said this before, and I'll say it again, it bears repeating. Only God can forgive our sins. We believe when you say yes to Jesus, to put your belief in Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, that you begin a relationship with God. But we've also said he uses people, his church, to help us overcome our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and to help push us toward our full potential. And so it's vital that we surround ourselves with the right people and that it's uh, also one of the most important steps in our spiritual journey. So we have to, we have to look at our life. We said last week we, we pivot by putting our, our foot in the ground, and then we have a pivot foot, and then we have a swing foot. And we have, we have, we're rooted in our, our mission as a church. We're rooted in our values as believers, maybe our, our, our beliefs, and we're rooted in this, and then we have to shift and we have to pivot to whatever comes our way. And so I wanna take you back to that moment when you thought, okay, this is good, how does it apply? Here's how it applies in our relationships. We, we stand firm in who we are in Christ, and then we have to look around us and say, how do we deal with every relationship in our life? Because this person is dysfunctional. This person's great. This person harms me. This person scares me. <laughs> Don't point. How do you, how, as you pivot, how do you deal with all the people around you? How do you find people that will walk through trials and triumphs and do life with you and help, each, help you grow and develop you and your spiritual growth? How do you do that? So let's ponder for a second. Think about your life right now. Just think about it. Think about your hopes and your dreams. What are your hopes and your dreams? You're like, well, I had them until 2020. You're like, my hopes and my dreams is that Georgia one day will beat Alabama. <laughs> Come on, Braves, you got one more shot. One or shot. Don't let us down, right? No, but think about your hopes and your dreams. Think about your joys and your accomplishments. Think about your, your disappointments and your struggles. Your fears and your frustrations. Think about all of those things. I know it's hard in this moment, but as you process these, maybe this is an exercise for you to deal with later. But as you process those, now take what you just began to think of, those small snippets of things, I know it's a lot, and consider the way your key relationships with those people you spend, the, consider those people you spend the most time with, the most time you invest your energy or your time or you allow to influence you, consider who those people are. Now, here's the question. What is the correlation between the relationships you have and the situations you face? You can, most of you will be able to draw and go, oh. <laughs> you, you think about your marriage and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I got hopes and dreams, but she screwed me up, you know what I mean, whatever. Or you think about your hopes and your dreams and now you realize you're walking in that together as a family because of what you're doing. Or you think about your hopes and your dreams and you say, well, I would do that, but we don't have this. And so I got these people in my life and they're constantly dragging me down and I'm constantly caring for. Or you think about your failures and your past. And all those are generally tied to what? Relationships. And so then as we, as we think about the relationships in our life, I'm going to encourage you to make four what we're calling pivotal relational choices today. Get it? See how we work that in there? Pivotal, okay? What I want to talk to you about briefly is how do you address the relationships in your life that will change the course of you reaching your full potential in Jesus? See, this was not as fun as last week. But I tell you this, it is one of the most foundational things you'll ever do in reaching your full potential. So here we go. Number one, focus on nurturing the relationships that are most important to you. Focus on nurturing the relationships that are most important to you. And so for some of us, you have to look at your life and say, where am I spending my time? Where am I putting my money, my resources, my energy? Are we focused on nurturing those relationships or hanging out with our boys? Or spending time, all our spare time, just doing stuff for fun? Because too many people, I will see it. I've, I don't do counseling because I'm a terrible counselor. I'm a terrible counselor. Here, you ever, just go on, like, there's this video on YouTube. It's old, old, old. 
but where a person comes into a counseling uh, appointment and the counselor, all he can do is say, just stop it. And so they would say, but you're, and he would say, he said, well, just stop it. That's, like, that's me. I was like, just stop this and do that. I'm a terrible counselor. So don't come to me for counseling. Because what, what it, sometimes it's so simple, but it ain't easy, right? Like we know what to do, but it's hard to do it, right? Like you know what you need to change. I know what I need to change, but it's very difficult at times to actually change that. And so we say, okay, duh, we want to focus on these people that are close to us and the most important relationships, but we don't do it. And too many people come and sit down in a counseling appointment and they complain about the quality of their most important relationship, but they do very little to nurture it or them. My kids are running crazy. Well, yeah, because you have them seven hours a day on their iPhone at nine. And you're not spending any time with them. I can't tell you, listen, my kids, and y'all got them kids that are like, Daddy, can we do something? Anybody got those kids? I swear, it's like there's this, there's this trigger that hits my kids, and that's when the recliner pops. Pff, Dad's sitting down. It's time to ask him. Dad, can we go outside? I'm like, it's 945 at night. No, we can't go outside. Sometimes you just get up, don't you, as a dad? Not because you want to, but because you want to nurture that relationship. And I love what Teddy Roosevelt said. He said, complaining about a problem without posing a solution is called whining. <laughs> My marriage sucks. What are you doing about it? Hey, I just tell her how she ought to act, and she don't act that way. She, doesn't, she don't do what I want her to. And he's just always doing, it's like, what are we doing to fix it? What, so some of you have had marriage problems for 12 years and never went down and actually dug into your own life and said, what's my problem? Because what I know is this, if your spouse, listen, your spouse needs to know they're second to only God in your relationship. But we, we neglect time to invest, our, we, we neglect the opportunity to invest time, attention, and energy into our relationships, our, our marriages, our kids, those that are closest to us. And then we wonder why the person feels like their needs aren't being met. <laughs> and we were like, well, what, what, what do you mean I don't meet your needs? We wonder all these questions. It's because we don't let people know how important and valuable they are by how we spend our time and our energy. Our children have to know that you love them even when you don't always like what they do. How many of y'all love everything your kids do? Come on. We will, I'll give you the microphone right now. You can tell us how. No, we, we have to love them in spite. They have to know, oh, God, here we go. Like you, have to, you have to put on your poker face sometimes, right? Like, I just want to, hey, buddy, let's talk, right? Because what's most important is that I'm here to walk, because what I don't want them to do is be 17 and need somebody to talk to, and I've damaged that relationship, and now 17 years old, they do their own thing because we didn't nurture it. And so if your relationships aren't where you want them to be, here we go, simple, but it ain't easy. Try nurturing them. And so I'm going to keep going back to this book that we've been talking about now for a while. Um, some of you have taken this, and it's been great to hear your stories. It's called, I said this, uh, you heard that. Uh, it's torture. I'm not going to lie, it's torture. Um, what this is, uh, let me explain. Uh, there's a difference in your temperament and your personality. Your personality is made up of how you were kind of wired and then all the experiences and, 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 and things that you've faced in life and you've kind of developed a personality. Now, something more foundational to the core of your being is called your temperament. Your temperament is your natural wiring, your natural style, how you hear things, how you say things. And this is great. If, if you have the same temperament as your spouse or your kids or other people in your life, um, it's great if you have the same temperament. But when you don't have the same temperament, Y'all, it's painful. Have you ever said, that's not what I said? Come on. I'm like, no, you said this. No, I didn't say that. It's because I said this. You heard that. Yeah, this is available in the Resource Center today. For some of you, this is your next step right here. Okay? So Julie and I did this, and... um. Just to give you a little, I mean, there's all kind of little tests. I mean, there's a little test in here. It's a 40-question test. 
Now, here's what I love about these things. Most of the time, you'll take these tests. If you're a red or a green, you're natu- I mean, a red or a yellow, you're naturally extroverted. That's kind of your, your wiring. If you're a, a green or a blue, you're naturally introverted. And so reds and yellows are like, yay, I'm a red and I'm a yellow sucker. Like, you're proud of it. <laughs> Greens and blue are like, I'm, um, should I be that? I'm not real sure if I, but should I? And so, like, but some of us really like our style. Some of us don't like our style. But as you read this, it's fun to read your strength. It's like, yeah, I am. It's painful to read your weaknesses. So I have a yellow. Um, he's eight. He's about to be nine. Y'all. He uses all of, his, all of the words that I have. And I preach on Sundays with thousands of words. He's used them up by 9 a.m. <laughs> he, he, we're spending some time with family this weekend and little bits and pieces trying to celebrate uh, components of his birthday. He thinks it's birthday month, and he can't shut up about his birthday. And he just, today I'm sitting back in my office, and I'm just rereading over some stuff. He's just like, Daddy, you know, and I'm excited about it. And I'm like, Mom, please come get this child, right? <laughs> Love the kid. But sometimes I'm like, Bud, you, you know, this is like the 17th time. You've told me the same story with the same enthusiasm. <laughs> it's hard for me to respond 17 times like I'm just as excited as I was the first time. Because I wasn't that really that excited the first time you told me. Come on. He's a yellow. Any yellows in the house? Where are you at? Woo! See? If I said any greens in the house, you're going to be like, I, no, 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 don't ask me that. Right? Reds. Yeah, you want to be in control. In fact, you're mad because you just, you just yell before I ask you to over the yellows because you need to be in control of the room. <laughs> I'm a red, so I, I get it. Like, we have strengths. We have, and, then, and then so I'm a red, I have a yellow red, and then I have my oldest is kind of red blue, which is weird because it's like I'm extroverted sometimes, introverted sometimes. I like to be in control sometimes, and I doubt other times. Any Blues are the ones who are... Uh, you, you look in and you're introspective and you, you, you know, you, you, you can be moody. Come on, anybody in the house? Don't point. Good mood today, huh? Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you're analytical. You got good strengths, but like you don't want to let people down. Green, same thing. Man, you're just super easy going. You're steady. Don't rock the boat. Any greens in the house? See? You're like, No. We stay like this all the time. It would be foolish of me to raise my voice, right? I mean, I'm being extreme here, but like, you're like, yes. Here's the problem. Red walks in the room to a green and starts talking to a green in a red tone. Green loses. I think we need a divorce, right? No, I was just, I was just passionate. So I, I say all this and you're laughing, but we take these temperaments and uh, my wife is a blue and I'm a, I'm a red. So what I thought we could do is, it's great to read your strengths, right? So I did this one time before and I'll do it again. Um, uh, my, my strengths, there's, there's a bunch of them in here, not just my strengths, there's a bunch of them for all of us, sorry. That sounded really arrogant as, as a red. If a blue said it, it'd be great, but no, a red said it, so you got to pre- preface it with everything. Um, <laughs> so, so. There's a, there's a list, if you go to the back, there's a list of all your strengths, and you're like, yeah, sucker. And then there's an equally matching list of all your weaknesses. Take one of those at a time. <laughs> but then they break it down to your most powerful strengths. And a red choleric, I love these, are responsible, decisive, and good at delegating, dynamic leaders who excel at managing tasks and projects. And I'm like, sucker. One of my favorite ones, I always throw this in, is in the reds. Any reds in the house, you would appreciate this. There's a long one, and it said, usually right. Intuitively right. And I'm like, see? All right. That's great until you realize your weaknesses. <laughs> Can argue, dominate, and use a harsh tone. Has a tendency to be bossy, impatient, and intolerant. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> right? Now, then I, I live with a blue. Closest person in my life is a blue. 
she's both analytical and creative. And we talked about that word creative. And we found areas that she actually, she was like, I don't think I'm creative. And then as we discovered, I'm like, actually, you know, there's some, not, she's not like artistic. Don't, she's not going to write a song for you. She's a perfectionist who, who is detailed, orderly, compassionate, and often artistic and musical. No, okay. Um, which is great because I'm like, that's not me at all. Like, I'm analytical a little bit, but, like, I'm like, problem solved. Don't overanalyze, right? She likes to analyze, and she's you know, wants to make sure everything's orderly. And I'm like, no. And I'm upset in the apple cart because, like, I'm like, change, baby. Let's change it. Okay? And then her weakness is, sorry, baby, got to do it. Um, can remember the negatives. Fear's failure. Can't have a low self-esteem. She doesn't have a low self-esteem, but has a tendency to be judgmental and critical. <laughs> so here I am trying to make a decision, and she's overanalyzing and being critical of my decisions, right? You see how this goes? All right, now, I don't have time to go into all the colors, but, but I say all that to say, I, this is meant to help you learn to nurture the relationships closest to you. And so we've done this with my parents, we've done this with our kids. For example, my, my yellow, sanguine talker, I've learned to respond with the same enthusiasm that he comes to me with because that's how he feels love. So he's like, Daddy, 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 what, what? I found a frog. And I'm like, whoa, let's go see it, right? It's yellow. It's like, and he, it's like he's on, but when I'm like, that's good. And he's like, that, does, that doesn't love me, right? And so there's all these work, and I love it. Here's the thing. Yellow's, he's like, yellow's like to take the test and say, I'm a yellow. I don't have to do anything else. Red's like to take the test and make everybody do everything in the book. I'm simply saying nurture, and here's a tool. Here's a tool to nurture your marriages, your kids, your brothers, your sisters, people to walk through. Get this and learn to communicate. Don't be like, well, that's just how I am. I'm a red. That's how I talk. No, you learn to communicate in the language of the person that you're communicating to. And that's a game changer when it comes to nurturing your relationships. Write this down. You can't grow in your faith by walking alone. You can't grow in your faith by walking alone. This is so vital because too many people that are married are trying to grow in their faith and they're walking in different directions. Your kids can't grow in their faith by trying to figure it out alone. And so you and I need love, support, and accountability that comes from Christian community, deep biblical community. So nurture the relationships that are most important to you, and that should include not only your immediate family, but other believers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ that will challenge you. Number two, choose to restore the broken relationships in your life. And the first one was fun. This one's not. Choose, because it is a choice, to restore the broken relationships in your life. Usually broken relationships are a result of two sinful people hurting each other. Now, sometimes it's one sinful person hurting another sinful person. So if something happened to you and you were taken advantage of or as a child, that, that's not your fault. Don't hear what I'm not saying. So how do you know? How do you know how, what broke the relationship? I'm going to give you an acrostic. I gave this to you earlier in the year. It's called MIA. Okay, it's not missing in action, okay? Three ways. M, is it a misunderstanding? Do you know how many of y'all are mad at something that happened 12 years ago that was simply a misunderstanding? And you've been calling that person names for 12 years, and you're like, oh, if you really understood, and you really came to the table, and you learned to communicate, and you'd be like, oh, that was, <laughs> really wasn't that big a deal. Is it a misunderstanding? Is it intentional? I. This is different, isn't it? If somebody's intentionally hurting you or it's intentionally hurt you, there's a different way to deal with it. And the third one is, have assumptions been made? MIA. Misunderstanding, intentional, or assumptions. So if assumptions have been made, sometimes we just have to have a conversation, don't we? So if it's a misunderstanding or assumptions have been made and you haven't had a conversation, listen to me, that is 100% on you. Well, they just hard to talk to. Have you tried? Well, yes, I've tried. Okay, well, then have you tried face-to-face, not via whatever backlog, direct message, social media site? Because this is how God would have us do it. You say, what if they won't talk to me? Or what if they live hundreds of miles away? Well, here's a passage for you that I believe Paul tells us very specifically how we should respond. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So what can you do? Can you just write them a letter apologizing for your side? What if they hurt you? What if they abused you? That's different. Those are intentional things that have happened to you. And I think, yes, we'll talk about forgiving and letting go, but we have to talk about also protecting ourselves, don't we? 
But what happens to us in these situations, we have pride, we have ego, and we don't want to deal with that. We just, we just bore and go, this is the way I'm going to do it, this is the way I was wired. But listen to me. The pain of unresolved conflict is greater than the pain required to resolve it. You say, you don't know what I've been through. Listen, I'm not asking you again. Don't hear what I'm not saying. What I am saying is you can live for decades with it or you can deal with it and be free from it. And if you don't believe me, you can ask some people who started this journey through the good life. And finding in the process freedom from the pains and the hurts and the unforgiveness and the doubt. Talk to some people who've been through counseling and let go of things. Talk to people who've been through Celebrate Recovery and have let things go from the people or forgiven the people who've hurt them in their lives. And now they have more joy in their soul that helps them not live day to day, every single day in the pain of what's happened to them. The best gift you can give yourself is to, is to forgive anyone who's wounded you in some way. But forgiveness requires something of us. It requires us to take a step, and it requires us to choose. You say, what if, what if, I, what if I have someone, like, I, what, what if I need, I, I'm, I want to ask for forgiveness or whatever, like, I, I try to get them to forgive me, but they won't, they won't forgive me, and I'm having a hard time. What, what do I do with the whole forgiveness thing? Listen, admit your wrongdoing, attempt to restore the relationship the best you can. That's what your responsibility, that's what my responsibility is. If they don't come around, you've done everything you can to live at peace with everyone, as far as it depends on you. Number three, got to hurry. Know when to walk away. Some of you are like, I I told him I was leaving. (laughs) That's not what I'm talking about, okay? Know when to walk away. Okay, so I'm here. I'm rooted in my values and mission. Here's who God's calling me to. Are there relationships that are causing so much harm and dysfunction that I can't just keep those people very close to me? So some relationships are so harmful and so toxic that you simply must walk away in order to maintain a firm boundary. So we want to have a pivot foot. We want to stay grounded, but we got so many, relate. I mean, it's hard when the relationship's just constantly pulling, right? And you and I have to determine what relationships are so toxic that we can't even stay grounded in our faith. And otherwise, they'll continue to undermine what God is trying to do inside you. But what we tend to do is tell ourselves, uh, we rationalize, don't we? That's why we rationalize. We tell ourselves rational lies and we go, okay, I can keep, grounded i can stay here and have a pivot but but still have this relationship over here right this is why the tendency for a woman who's in a in a in a, in a abusive relationship to stay or to continue going back they've been out they go back they've been out they go back See, you don't understand my what i'm going through yeah you're right that's why i'm asking you to come get help This is also why a person who says, I want to stay rooted in my faith. Ready for this? But I'll get in a relationship with somebody and I'll get the sexual cart before the marriage horse. And we'll just do everything because we get tax breaks or we we need to pay the bills and I'll, I'll rationalize sin in my life for a relationship that's only undermining my faith. And I'm not here to say, it's easy to go, listen, you don't understand. You're just old school. No, no, no. There's something in the Bible that we believe is the absolute truth of what God says. And what my hope is, is in our life is that we want to stay grounded in our faith and pivot in our circumstances. It's hard to do when we're allowing relationships that cause sin or toxicity in our life. And so don't be trying to divorce your spouse just because you don't like them today. But if you're in a harmful relationship, you say, what do I mean by that? Abuse. What do I mean by abuse or toxic? If it's harmful to your mind, body, and soul, it's abusive. It causes stress, pain, and deception that are just, I don't mean like, a, like, like I stress my wife out, okay? I get it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, like overwhelming to the point where it's crushing down on you. Then, then, then get in touch with your care at myrelevant.cc and let's set you up to talk to somebody and get you out. I don't know if I want to do the whole counseling thing then sit there and die a miserable, emotional, spiritual death. Hear me. There's nothing wrong with talking to somebody. And so if you're going through that, you you don't know what to do or how to do it, let us help you navigate that. And then for sometimes, after you look at this, you're going to be like, well, should I walk away? 
or should I just redefine the relationship? Because sometimes you don't need to walk away. You just have to redefine it. So if you have an in-law or an outlaw or whatever you want to call them, that's causing dysfunction in your family, but it's not like harmful, you just have to set new boundaries, don't you? Redefine that. Don't just abandon them. Set the new boundaries in your life. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Who are some people you should be walking away from? I don't mean abandoning and leaving them out to dry, but maybe, maybe you're drinking buddies that took you a little too tipsy last night when you were watching the game. Maybe those are people you need to distance yourself from because they're causing you to wobble off your pivot foot. Maybe it's the cohabitation, the relationship. You're, 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 you're sleeping together. You're doing things that are dishonoring to God. You, you need to walk away. Get that thing back in order. We can help you with that process. Maybe you need to walk away from your gossip club. <laughs> you're like, well, I just listen. Well, you're part of the problem. So how do I know when to sever or when to redefine the relationship? What are, what are some guidelines? Here it is. If a relationship hinders your relationship with God, then you need to either redefine it or sever it. One of the two. Is it pulling me off my pivot foot? Is it keeping me from focus? Then I need to redefine it and say, okay, we're going to set some boundaries and not let you have that much power over me. Or, look, I just got to get away from this relationship in order for it to help me reach my full potential. So who's in your circle of influence? Who is it? Look around. My circle, think about it, my circle of influence. Look here. How am I addressing those people in my circle? I see it's real simple. And here's the last one. Risk being real. Risk being real. Here's what I'm challenging every single person to do. Is to take the risk of initiating some meaningful relationships in your life. Take the risk. What if I open up? What if I share? What if I let somebody get too close to me? Again, I'll take you back to several things that I think are helping people take next steps. What I love is that we launched something called Super Groups this past January. And uh, through this season, we had quite a few super groups continue to maintain throughout the whole time. Do you know we have people from like South Carolina and Tennessee and other states that are connected in super groups? It's crazy. They're online virtual groups. Somehow they've been able to find people they can connect with. We have Celebrate Recovery. Man, I, I was here this past Tuesday night and just witnessed someone share their story and uh, just saw the energy and the, the love in the room of people helping each other reach their full potential. You say, well, Celebrate Recovery is not for me. Okay, well, what is for you? So in January, I know it's a long time, but I'm asking you right now, I'm going to have to pound it in your head till December 31st or till January 15th, whenever it starts. We believe, I believe, more important than you attending on a Sunday morning is that for every person who calls this church their home to go through the good life. I'm telling you, it is life-changing. And uh, it'll, it'll help you Risk being real. And it's tough. Not tough. In a, like it's, it's like one of those things like, I'm smiling and I feel really, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm happy about, like I'm, I'm taking steps that I've not taken in my whole life. Because we want to help you reach your full potential in Jesus. Because the enemy doesn't want you forming strong, meaningful relationships that draw you closer to God and help deepen your faith. Why has 2020 been so hard? Yes, there's physical things. Yes, there's um, financial situations and job situations and stress. And, but I'll tell you the reason I believe 2020 has been so hard for a vast majority of people is because of isolation. It's real simple. And I'm not making any political statements about a virus, and I'm not an expert, but I'm just going to tell you there's a whole new side of things talking about the mental health crisis and how if we're not careful we'll shut everybody out from relationships with each other so much that we will be dealing with pain for decades why has it been so hard for us here it is hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching what is the day the day that jesus will Come back and restore humanity back to himself once and for all and end this thing on earth. It's hard when you can't get together with people who inspire you and encourage you. So connect to your local church. Connect. You say, well, I don't even, 
Hey, listen, I understand if you are in a season of life where you can't connect right now and you're connecting online, stay connected. Connect in a super group. Connect with people outside of here if you aren't comfortable being here yet. Ephesians 2.19, you're members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. And then I would say partner in your local church. Don't just sit, don't just attend. Partner. What is partners? Partnership. We partner with you to help you reach your full potential. You partner with Relevant to help us reach this community. And that's what we do. We partner together for the cause of Christ. And we don't just visit. We don't just attend. We surround ourselves with people doing life together and making a difference. Okay, so next week we're going to end the series. We're going to talk about anxiety. But in the meantime, you can sign up for First Step coming in a couple weeks. I think we got Next Step happening today, which that comes after First Step, so don't get it backwards. But it's a way you can get involved in what's happening and be a part of the day-to-day process of reaching this community. And then I'm, I'm challenging you to listen to me. In the meantime, if you need to email the office and let's take, help you take some steps to reach your full potential, I want you to do that. But I'm challenging every single one of you in January to be a part of the good life. I mean that. We've asked every staff, every small group leader, every single person in ministry, I'm asking you and everybody that calls this church their home, take that step. Do the hard work because I'm telling you, it will change your life. Can I pray for you? God, we love you. And we're thankful for your love and your grace. And there are people in this room that are navigating a lot of relational crisis. There are people online navigating a lot of chaos in their relationships, not knowing how to respond, not knowing what to do. I pray you give us wisdom to stay rooted and planted and to deal with our circle of influence according to the things that we talked about today from your word. We love you. We thank you that we have brothers and sisters in Christ to do life together with. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.